to thank first of all the organizers for having us here and also for the support during the organization of this panel and of course also the speakers because we had exchanges before coming here. And the panel has announced uh, will focus on armed politics and power, which is an extremely broad subject, very difficult to grasp, and yet unavoidable when it comes to talk about cultural practices that try to unfold in a critical perspective. So we, we started thinking of this panel um, as a way to speak uh, from the work and the research of our panelists, and it was quite apparent that the question of the interplay between hard politics and power was not something to interrogate, but a given element in the work. And which does not mean that the question of the mutual relationship between our politics and power is not is going to be taken for granted in this session, but rather that the discussion will be engaged in the perspective of the specificity that each speaker has in their practice to engage uh, these questions. So without further delay, uh, I will have now the pleasure of introducing uh, our speakers, starting from Professor Yashadata Sumai Alon, uh, who presently works at the School of Arts and Aesthetics in uh, Jabalhal Nehru University in New Delhi. Professor Alon's research interest includes uh, an extremely broad uh, visual material, I would say, spanning from ancient Indian art, Buddhist art, modern Indian and popular visual culture, critic of post-colonial paradigms, and more recently he is involved in the concerted formulation of the notion of protective ignorance that we will also address during this presentation. And then afterwards, uh, Raghel Andoni Isaac, from Dale Sagur in Palestine, who works as a program manager, IT specialist, and communication officer at the Swiss Corporation offers in Gaza and the West Bank, the SDC, in which context she managed several social cultural development programs in collaboration with the cultural scene in Palestine, including cultural stakeholders and players. And together with her daughter, artist Rihanna Isaac, she is the co-founder of Al Salon, which is the first independent art space in the East Sabor. Then I would like to welcome Lindsay Doy, uh, who is an international conflict management professional, strategist, and dancer choreographer. Most recently, uh, Lindsay led and conducted the research for an initiative in South Africa with the University of Cape Town and the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation to develop artistic approaches to social dialogue uh, a project that earned the 2018 Martin Hondel Award uh, for the promotion of human rights from the University of Bursa. And she uh, also partnered with the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute to elevate the profile of peace speaking artists in conflict affected countries. And besides that, Lindsay has 18 years of artistic experience uh, choreographing for numerous dance companies in the United States and in Latin America. And then uh, Abel, Abel Wahab, so there on the left, uh, an Egyptian theater director, curator, and culture manager based in Alexandria City. Uh, from 2006, he worked as a project manager in various cultural organizations, and then he founded the Hewa Independent Theater Company. And in 2012, together with uh, uh, this company in Alexandria, he initiated and directed four, direct, uh, four editions sorry, of the Theatre is a Must, which is an independent international theatre forum for contemporary political and social political theatre. Uh, he is also the director of several performances, and among his latest pieces, uh, a German Egyptian interdisciplinary theatre production called Music for Unstageable Theatre. And uh, last but not least, Emma Wolkau Manangwa, who is an artist and researcher sitting here on my left. She is currently a research fellow in fine art at the University of Berlin in Norway and the convener of the African Cluster of the Northern Roadmap School, which is a research consortium comprising scholars and practitioners of art education based in eight African cities. And as an artist, Emma works in a wide range of media formats and contexts and among the recent uh, exhibitions, uh, I would like to mention 
Don Santo released his play devices for critical modernity in Sevilla and Museum Matters at the Stratkelly in Stuttgart. So welcome to all of you. Just before we open the first presentation, some very short words about how we decided to operate for the panel. The proposals shared with the panelists in preparation for this session was to introduce projects and concepts that are part of the current work and research. So we will start with a series of statements from each of them, and we will conclude with a question and answer session where you are all invited to participate and maybe also some of the questions that were not addressed in the previous panel that also talk about uh, the interplay between art and politics in many ways uh, can join our discussion now. So the focus is on current practices and projects underway, which nonetheless implies addressing the past and how alter alternate, alternate sorry, historical narratives may be addressed studied and hopefully the center and the colonized in order to produce different constellations for the present. And in this, uh, I think in this perspective that we are going now to welcome the first two statements from the panel, first by Emma Polita Wanakwa and then by Professor Alon. Emma, you are the floor. Good afternoon and um, thank you for this invitation. Um, I think I'm quite rare in this room in that English is my first language, um, which will make me possibly a bit lazy or colloquial. If I say things that people don't understand, um, please be sure to mention it. Um, I get it's three o'clock. Um, I have had huge problems <laughs> working out how to do this presentation. And I really am so bad at PowerPoint. So I thought I would come and stand next to Ines quickly. Um, I've made a last minute decision about what I'm going to talk about. Um, I want to just flick through very quickly um, what would have been the presentation, which is about this very complicated, um, totally brilliant, really inspiring, um, and extremely productive project on the Roadmap School. But I don't think there's time to get to all of that in 10 minutes, so I'm just going to flip through really fast <laughs> <laughs> until I find the bit that I think I can talk about in 10 minutes, which is this. Um, thank you. Okay. So, um, what you are looking at here is a poster which is about A3 size that was created during an impromptu silkscreen workshop in January of this year in Maseru, Lesotho, um, where um, the Africa cluster of another roadmap school was meeting for its third colloquium in the first phase of its project. Dineo, who spoke on the previous panel, um, is part of the Maseru working group of another roadmap school. Um, and one of the things we were doing, because it's been the end of our, um, we're coming to the end of our, our time together and the money that we have to meet, um, and we were looking at the work that has come out. Now, this poster, I'm just trying to, see I told you I can't do anything with PowerPoint. Okay, so this poster, um, first of all, it was created using a prototype of a silkscreen in a box kit that was created by the Johannesburg Working Group of the Africa Cluster. The Johannesburg Working Group have been, in one of many things that they've been doing, has been investigating the history of the Medu Art Ensemble, which was formed in 1977 by activists who fled apartheid South Africa for Botswana. Um, and they, they framed themselves as cultural workers rather than activists, uh, rather than artists, excuse me. And um, they used that they, they worked in a variety of different forms and media to create awareness of the struggle against apartheid and to sustain that struggle. Um, the group got some money in 1984 um, to try and make a silkscreen in a, in a box kit that could be, sent, could be smuggled into South Africa to, um, to be used easily by township organizations. Um, unfortunately, it only ever became a prototype in 1985 
Um, their offices in Gaborone um, were raided by the South African Defence Force um, and 12 people were, were murdered. Um, and so that was when the activities came to an end. But this is a critical history, the Johannesburg uh, Working Group argues, and I think Africa Cluster also argues, in terms of thinking about the role of culture production in Africa and recovering and making those histories active in the present. So um, this was, I think, the first time the kit has been used. I, again, forgot to put the image of um, its subsequent use in another workshop that they've done since, where a variety of different young people have, have used this kit to... Um, to create, to, to create their own um, images and their own work. Um, the second thing, where are we? Three minutes, okay. Um, the second thing I want to talk about um, in relation to this image is the text, People Who Think Together Dance Together. Now, um, People Who Think Together Dance Together began as many things do, I think, in the Africa cluster, somewhat casually, as um, through the insistence of one of our members that one of the things that we always did when we met and talked about our research and showed one another our work and advised one another on that work and planned future, future how we can take that, back, that work back to the communities and the constituencies that we work with in all these different cities in Africa was that we also danced together. We had to have a dance party. And so it, it was an insistence that appeared somewhere halfway through the project that we had to find a venue and this had to happen because actually it was part of our thinking process um, and it was about letting off it somehow began in this way but actually the text in itself has become very this this formulation of words has become very important to us um, because it starts to point away to, uh, it starts to point in the direction of some of the complexities of investigating understanding, delinking, um, and finding emancipatory strategies for culture production in post-independence Africa. Um, the example, I am part of the Kampala Working Group. Um, I am an itinerant member of that group. Um, but where I work in central Uganda, the main language is Luganda. They were the ones that the British liked, which is why the country's named after them. Um, and one of the things that we discussed a lot in the Africa cluster also in Uganda, but across the continent increasingly, is that there is no adequate translation for the words art and design in the local indigenous language. There's no Luganda word for art, there's no Luganda word for design. Anytime you see these words, they have to use the European equivalent. Now, this doesn't mean that people are not artistic, are not, are not involved in my preferred formulation, um, which I learned from Ruben Gastampide Fernandez, who's in the Toronto Working Group, um, which is symbolic creative work. Does not mean that this work doesn't happen. It just means it has a very different social and economic distribution. But if one is to understand genuinely and to engage with cultural production in this context, these words have to be problematized. The separation between disciplines that has been an inheritance of colonialism itself has to be set to one, has to be maybe provincialized, I don't know if that's the right word, but has to be called into question in order to start to understand and appreciate the ways in which those kinds of practices um, evolved, continued, endured, and um, continue to drive discourses in the present. Now, connection with, in connection with this, like, what it means to put words like art, design, and also education into question is that, um, that I think that what has emerged from our work over the last couple of years is a very clear sense of symbolic creative work as a form of knowledge production. That it's not necessarily about knowledge that then has, it has a message that is um, transmitted in the form of a painting or a multimedia performance, but that actually this is a way of doing the thinking. And um, it's also a way of doing the thinking collectively, which I think is a huge, um, which is something which I think within the context that we are working um, has a huge amount of urgency. Um, so I think, where are we, seven minutes? So actually, even though it sounds like it's quite casual, we are thinking when we're dancing, and we are doing that work. Um, and it might actually not just be about dancing, because we're also listening to music while we're making screen prints, we're doing all sorts of different things. 
but that one of the key activities that um, the support of Prao Vets Johannesburg has enabled is for us to start to interrogate this territory, which as you can see has a very explicit um, historical dimension. It's very intimately connected with the histories of the various different peoples of the African continent, um, of whom only very few are currently involved in, in the Africa cluster of another roadmap school. But actually it's about, it's about addressing the kind of epistemological level um, which then enables, um, that then enables grounds to shift within the context of pedagogy, within the context of social organization, within the context of economics. And if, even if that is just about making connections between the practices that are ongoing and those practices which become visible only within the framework of a European Eurocentric um, vocabulary. So um, that's one thing I want to say. The last thing I want to say in the final moment um, is that it's one of, the most one of the most precious things about this project, for me personally, and I think I'm not the only person um, in the project who would say this, is that it has enabled us to meet. There is almost, it is almost impossible in Africa to meet the neighbors. Our first meeting in um, Uganda in 2015 would have been cheaper if we'd held it in Lisbon in terms of flights, had we been able to get Schengen visas. So um, one of the most important things in the, in a, in the context where, which is very, very resource poor in the, what we would argue is a very, very essential area. There are very few departments of art education. There are almost no professorships. There are no research institutions. There are very few publications. Um, there are very few translations of the little work that is done um, between one context and another. So we have still very canalized or atomized along along the borders that were drawn in 1884, more or less, in Berlin. And I think that one of the things that's really beginning very exciting about the work that we've been doing has been that by bringing people together to talk about what they t how they teach, what they teach, how they learn, what they think learning is, and how that learning might be produced, is that the connections that it's making between different contexts are extraordinary and the kinds of alliances that it's allowing us to build and to, as practitioners of, of artistic education, the knowledge base it's enabling us to draw upon when we then try to speak to heads of department, universities, etc., about the very fundamental issues about teaching and learning is amazing. So it's been an extraordinary gift for all of us and um, we're very grateful to Joseph Gaylord and to his team in Johannesburg for having faith in us and getting this thing going. And um, had I not been so ill this week, I would have updated our pages on the website. There are a lot of pictures at the end of this PowerPoint which you can show. Um, I think it's from page 15 um, of some of the activities that have been going on. But this is literally just what I've managed since I've been able to get out of bed. Um, you can just keep going. There's uh, various different ones. But this is... Um, this has, been in the, this has been an extraordinary opportunity from which we are all learning. And as a result, those that we teach are also learning too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for, a, thanks for an invitation. And thanks for all here for giving me this opportunity to meet such a wonderful audience and also friends with them. Uh, so I'll stick to the time limit, which our moderator has strictly instructed to. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint will run, and you can see those images, and you'll have to listen to me. So, <laughs> so I'm sorry. Uh, there, are, there are fundamental problems which one needs to begin with. Say, for example, the issue of representation. So one has to really go beyond the whole aspect of denotation, connotation, and exemplification. Because these three ways of understanding representation is not conditioned enough, or it does not make an enabling condition or a process to create or to, un to, to understand the intricate issues of embedded aspects of representations. So therefore, one has to come out of
such ideas and see how the artworks which have been created over a period of time whether uh, what kind of meanings they are generating and how we are really try to understand it. another aspect with representation is that of the consciousness what kind of a consciousness it generates and how the consciousness of maker is involved in choosing certain visual signifiers or for that that matter going and exploring for certain set of visual signifiers in order to make its own political position in india there are a lot of problems with the modernity now the modernity in india has always been very cosmetic modernity it has not been a real modernity in the true sense or in a pure sense having said that the modernity in india being cosmetic and therefore it remain a brahmanic modernity it never empowered people to change it never empowered people to make any kind of a transformation and this became a stumbling block especially not only in india but the entire south asia and therefore it 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 never the, the, the society could not change their so society practices and their belief systems so uh, uh, and and then then one has to locate those things in the context of what is global and in, in, in mainly in terms of art to me global is materiality of material what i see that the agency of global which is being defined which is very eurocentric which is very american centric where the people really try to see who are the people who are engaged in exploring material different kind of material and making art so therefore you capture you catch hold of those people and then place them in a gallery and say it is global that's how the materiality of material is in practice and accepted as a logic of global art and this becomes an extremely problematic paradigm because it fails to understand the contextual politics as well as the contestations you may say that it adheres to the meta narratives of the so called modernity of formal language but in reality it does not go beyond visuality of the visual it doesn't translate beyond that and at the most you can write a page or two in the annals of global history art history but you cannot really make contestations out of those words 10 years 20 years or 50 years down the line so so there is this critique of discourse and interestingly the the critique of discourses at least in modern india what uh, what one can see is that dr ambedkar was the first one to present the critique of the imperial discourses the the brahmanical discourses and the marxian discourses now having by by seeing this critical paradox one has to really understand what you adhere to and then there is this uh, uh, problem of post colonial theory, theoretical paradigm you know many people say at, at least in india like subaltern 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 how do you define subaltern that itself is problematic how do you understand subalt which group is subalt see it's very simple dr ambedkar defines caste as not only division of labor but also division of laborers the the experience of division of laborers is very fundamental and the 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 the, uh, the nomenclature of subalt does not empower you to understand the experiences of the division of laborers then there is this <coughs> the entire post colonial paradigm theoretical paradigm which to me is a fantastic example of protected ignorance how do i define protected ignorance the 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 objective of the knowledge formation process is to that of there is that of holding of ignorance it becomes the right is right is objective it becomes the right is knowledge formation but if the objective of knowledge formation process is not to kill ignorances and to maintain the ignorances it becomes a protected ignorance it becomes a chosen condition for the self centric proclamations and these self centric proclamations are embedded in your presuppositions so you need to dismantle those presuppositions 
and without dismantling these presuppositions, you cannot claim to be in the process of the rightest kind of a consciousness, or for that matter, in the rightest consciousness of the knowledge formation product, uh, process. So, fantastic example I would like to give. Gandhi is a fantastic example of protected ignorance. Gandhi subscribed to the idea of Varna. He believed in the caste duty. He believed in the Sanatani idea of Hinduism. He believed even in racism. So Gandhi cannot be idealized as a as a as a, as a um, uh, you know uh, 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 as a champion of humanity. No, that's incorrect. It's a fantastic example of protected ignorance. Similarly, I tell you this. In the morning session, there was a reference to the Patanjali Yoga Sutra. That example, evoking of that example itself was a part of the protected ignorance. So there are many of those things. Then there are those anti-caste narratives that have emerged in India. And also there is this paintings which, which you are, I am sure you are seeing those paintings. So these are the important artworks which completely challenges the meta-narratives of the modernism it challenges the meta-narratives of the ethos of the so-called claimed democratic society in India. It also challenges the consciousness of your cultural practices. It also challenges the consciousness of your embedded inherent hatred. It also challenges the consciousness of your being, what kind of a being you are, whether your consciousness is going towards the rightness of your being or not. So it completely shakes the Indian society. There are many of those artworks which were banned. They were not allowed to exhibit. There have been many, many such painters who are practicing these kind of art practices, but they are not recognized. They do not get any kind of a platform. Why? Because gallery as an agency has become a pivotal in order to sanction what is La Avangar. It's only the gallery decide that what is law vanga. It's not a painter who is deciding. It's not an artist who is deciding. And these are very embedded questions which we generally fail to respond. We generally fail to address. And this not only has the economic dimensions, but it also has the cultural, social dimensions. And these dimensions are deeply connected with the ethos of the protected ignorance. Thank you. My name is Lindsay Doyle. Um, today, here I'm representing the Media and Arts for Peace initiative through the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And I'd like to start with a couple of anecdotes. So in 2004, the then leader of Al-Qaeda wrote, we are in a media battle in a race for the hearts and minds of our Muslim people. The foreign fighter movement that drew over 30,000 people to Syria and Iraq to fight on behalf of ISIS. They did this by tapping into the human spirit and amplifying that through social media and taking advantage of people's vulnerabilities and their lack of belonging in their own communities. And this recruitment strategy worked. At MAP, we're looking at two different problems. The first, is that there are threats to security and to peace building in today's world that are born from malicious use of media and the arts. If you read the headlines, I don't have to tell you that we are up against decreasing trust in institutions and media, rise of authoritarianism, normalization of violence in many different forms. The list goes on. At MAP, we believe that what bleeds doesn't have to lead that peace can be more captivating than conflict. We work with policymakers, development practitioners, artists, and media professor, professionals. And my partner in this work is a Syrian radio journalist by the name of Hania Saeed, who herself comes from a very personal experience of what it's like to be displaced by violent conflict. While creativity has been used destructively in some cases, it's also these same qualities of creativity that make it the perfect antidote to these issues. And I want to illustrate this by telling three stories of artist change makers. 
In August of last year in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the United States, where I come from, there was a protest organized by a white supremacist group called Unite the Right. And they marched with torches to the statue of a Confederate Army general by the name of Robert E. Lee. They marched in opposition to a move by the mayor of Charlottesville to remove this statue. And of course, this is all in the context of the wake of the election of our current president. A counter rally was also organized by Black, Movement, uh, by Black Lives Matter. And after the rally, as they were walking away from their protest site, a member of Unite the Right drove a car into this crowd, killing one and injuring another 16. In response to this, painter Titus Kafar, who works on Princeton University's Project on Slavery and Memory, went, to, went on National Public Radio, NPR, and he proposed an idea. Rather than fighting to remove Confederate statues, as many people were proposing, why not use contemporary art mediums and build new statues right next to the old statues to jumpstart a dialogue and to create a tension between these two things? Titus argued that if we remove Confederate statues, we are, are erasing reminders of our own uh, bygone era of racism and slavery in our own country. Art instead provides a viable alternative. Moving next to Mosul, Iraq. Also last year, the Iraq army and an international coalition pushed ISIS out of Mosul with quite a lot of military force, as you can imagine. With the tumultuous history of armed conflict in, this, in Iraq, Mosul as a city was once a budding center of cultural activity and arts, and it was left in ruins. He, he asked that each person that come to this festival bring one book, if they were able to, to replace the thousands of volumes that had been burned when ISIS overtook the city. Omar Mohammed suggests that when ISIS arrived, they not only brought their weapons, but they brought their version of history. He feared that without rebuilding an institution such as the university library, the history of Iraq would be lost to disinformation. This reading festival in Mosul drew an estimated 4,000 Iraqis. Lastly, I want to turn to the example of Battery Dance Company. In over 60 com countries, Battery Dance Company runs a program called Dancing to Connect. They respond to the lack of social integration among host communities and refugees, <coughs> mistrust between opposing sides of different conflicts, and the need to teach nonviolent communication in places where violence has been normalized. They invite people to explore their commonalities through movement and dance. And neuroscience research backs this up and suggests that when people move together in the same space, they have a heightened affinity toward the people that are around them. Battery Dance Company, when they evaluate their work, it demonstrates that they have measurable improvements in perceptions toward opposing groups and increased empathy. Beyond the courage and conviction of these three stories, there are some relevant ideas about how art and media can play a role in peace building, if they wish to. The arts are adept at mobilizing large groups of people to act in civic space, which is also a theme from this morning. The arts can give voice to those who are unable to use their own as a result of the security threats that they're under. They can speak to powerful actors such as policymakers and development actors to attract those kinds of resources to communities that need it most. They can enliven historical memory and contribute to reconciliation in creative ways. The role of arts and media professionals change as conflict dynamics change. And one of the ongoing challenges that I see from the perspective of social political change is how to connect the ground game 
to ongoing peace processes, which often operate at the national level and elite levels that are inaccessible to most. How can artists and media professionals have a seat at the table or otherwise contribute to concrete political processes and transitions? I will close by mentioning that our initiative has developed an online course if you're interested in learning more about this uh, particular application of arts and media. And it's, while it's somewhat geared toward the policymaker audience, it's open to the public. So I invite a, a constructive conversation about this application given what we're talking about in terms of independence of artists and, and how we could potentially build bridges between the peace building community and arts and media. Thank you. We have a cultural life, a full cultural life. 
like in Ramallah, like in Bethlehem, in others, in the villages, in the others, you will not see anything. For that, we said, okay. Uh, we decided to go for, for this program, which is to really try to enhance the social participation, social accountability, and uh, using art and culture. Here we are making it a little bit different. We are using art and culture as a tool to enhance the social participation. <coughs> and in the, in the other hand also, we wanted the people to be more active in voicing, uh, raising their voices and in uh, making a kind of dialogue of dialogue with their uh, local authorities. Because of that, we put the cultural in within the local governance domain. Our, uh, the way how we, our partner, we have one partner for this. Uh, actually, uh, it was designed in two modalities. The first modality is the people led art projects themselves. The other modality is the artist led art projects. Uh, in the two modalities, it's the mechanism that you have to invite the people for discussion to talk about the issues of their concern, and then they will come up with the way they wanted to present these uh, uh, issues uh, using any kind of uh, art uh, forms, and then open a discussion within the people themselves, with the people and with the authority decision -making. And actually, uh, with the second modality, the artists also, that they have to go to select the location they want to do the intervention there, and then they uh, talk, talk with the people, have several discussion, and then come up with the project they wanted to present. Of course, building from the ideas and the concerns of the people in the area, in that location. Actually, what we saw, uh, or to say that the results coming from this project is really promising. <laughs> we noticed that the people are really starting appreciating art and culture, and starting wanting because they they are the one who are making this. They feel the ownership of this. Uh, uh, work that they did. Second, they start feeling uh, that they are empowered and start feeling more confidence that they can really lead a change, do something, change the situation they are living in. The other issue that the artists themselves, which we at the beginning were very afraid that maybe the artists won't like because it's not a driven project. It's something that this is a this is a project and you come with the ideas, you do it, and then present it to the people. It's not, but it's within this theme. But the artists themselves, they said that they see more value with their art work because it's coming from the people themselves and the people can relate to what they are doing now. They go and they start questioning, they are talking about it. So. Here you could see that also the artists were very much really satisfied about their work now, and this is how they really announced it. Also what we see now is that there is, a, and, and this is something new, a new healthy uh, democratic dialogue between the people and the decision makers. I will go quickly to one example. We have many, many examples about the work that has been done uh, there. In, uh, but one very uh, inspiring uh, work was done in Qalqilya city. Qalqilya actually is known as a very conservative uh, city, north of Palestine. When the local team went to start working with the, the people there, uh, it was very difficult. They, at the beginning, they were very much hesitating to be 
to, to interact with them. It took them more than one year just to build the trust with the people there. After that, now we have in Kalkilia uh, 18 uh, teachers and social activists and person who are really uh, becoming like um, a core uh, for this project in Kalkilia. And they produce an art exhibition. They are not artists. They produced, they did an art uh, exhibition for the third hand exhibition. This art exhibition took two main issues they were uh, discussing. One is the marginalization of the woman. The second is uh, the second hand uh, furniture in the city. And then they show it and they called it the third hand exhibition. Uh, there you could see that this exhibition was visited by 1,000 people, people from uh, Falkyria city. It was also uh, take the attention of the media and also the municipality members there. And one of the municipality's uh, member asked to join the group and she's now part of this group. I will not talk a lot more, but I wanted to show now a small film about this exhibition and that you hear the people themselves talking about this project. Thank you.
we feel it's yeah, it's obvious we know what's culture, what uh, what we want to go, uh, uh, how we can do this. Something very important about this panel is called arts, politics, and power. Uh, like in Egypt, always we have this relation with uh, politics. Um, because, because for sure we, we, we had a regime uh, state for 60 years now, it's, uh, it's, it's the revival of this regime again after the revolution, and, uh, and for sure it's uh, for 30 years of Mubarak uh, time it was very stagnant uh, in Egypt, in Arab countries. But after the, uh, after the revolution, I started to think about uh, populism and the, the rising of populism. And I have noticed that not just uh, right wings have, uh, has uh, like supporting the populism, and uh, this idea also we have we have we have the left party sometimes, even in the revolution. Uh, generalization, stereotyping, and the professor here uh, said something about modernity, and he said it didn't let modernity in India and led to social uh, transformation because it was Eurocentric. And for me, also the revolution in Egypt. It, uh, it comes because, not because we have a heritage of ideologies or uh, good parties, but come because of populism, because uh, because of uh, the rising of new liberalism, uh, the media. It's, it's for me, it's like a circle, and we have to to, to be aware, and uh, we have to be know where where where, where exactly. And we, we, don't, we don't have to be shamed about uh, some stuff. So, sometimes we are, uh, like I'm with social transformation, and sometimes I'm not with the agenda of some uh, European or uh, Western uh, uh, organization when, she's, uh, when they said uh, our agenda is about social transformation. Like, I don't feel the link or the connection. So everything for me is con contextual, like it's, uh, and also this is the, the important thing. About power also, it's, uh, it's very scary also to talk to you, even I'm a performer, but, but, but it's very scary to talk to people when it's uh, light and people like this, and there's someone funny. And, yeah, it's, you can't expect anything, but this is authority also. This is power. This is power and how, how we can shift this power. Uh, or sometimes we, we think, sometimes we think that we use the power in the right, uh, uh, the right route or the wrong, uh, right path, and it is not. Uh, I want to say something also about, for me, what I know about power. Sometimes bureaucracy is power and limiting the art. And like I, I remember this, um, uh, I remember this uh, Russian artist. Uh, now he's not in Russia. He, I, I don't remember his name, but I remember his work when he went to the Kremlin and he put a nail in his testicles. And. And for us, for us and for Western world, it's very brave and it's, uh, it's something during the Putin regime and everything. But can we do something like this in Western uh, society, like Germany, like, uh, uh, like Switzerland? Uh, and he be acknowledged like uh, how he acknowledged in Russia? This is the thing. And the other thing also, it's term I discussed it with some friends, uh, one of them here, uh, last summer in the uh, Atrish uh, It's uh, the, the term is called uh, uh, 
politically exo uh, exotic. What is politically exotic and how we can use and play as artists and as organizations. We don't have to play, but we have to know if I am an organization and I won't touch this politically exotic, sensitive issue, I don't have to stop other stuff. I don't have to destroy the infrastructure. And this is what happened exactly in many places, like in Egypt and Syria, after the revolutions. And also it's related to the new agreements with the new authorities. Whatever, what is this authorities? Muslim Brotherhood or uh, military or... So it's the accumulation with people, with the people that we want them to have social transformation. And this is the, the main... The, the main relation we have to, to be aware when we are doing this. In the last panel, uh, my friends talked a lot about many important things about, uh, about uh, especially about uh, what? Uh, uh, it's, it's gone. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I forget, but they said something uh, I want to quote also. Yes, it's about, uh, let me, uh, like the, the, the discussion, let me think about one, another one question when we are playing now the game of uh, uh, play of uh, improvisation. Are European think, or do, do you think that the, the white supremacy or the white superiority is part of the culture? Something like this. Can we think like this? Can we criticize ourselves like this? Can I ask myself about Egyptians? Can uh, are they are, are Egyptian somehow uh, like to live in uh, to, to the Italian, uh, uh, atmosphere or something like this? And they will not produce even without this. I need these questions. Sometimes it's very easy to artists to acknowledge. Sometimes, sometimes not. Uh, please, uh, yeah, th this is uh, about uh, my theater festival. It's my theater festival, uh, no, the other photo. Uh, it was an initiative for me after uh, the revolution in Egypt. I tried not to, I, I just tried to uh, define what is political theater after the revolutions. I felt there is something we should say about. Uh, this revolution and uh, something we should say about uh, we should say and document and we should preserve our narrative because it's uh, and this is what happened now we are there is new narratives that against uh, like uh, distorted the narrative of the revolution and the narrative of people uh, uh, move uh, like uh, like went to streets to to, to build good reason to make social transformation now it's become conspiracy theory from the from some Western parties and a lot of people now start to believe in them too. So it's for me it was an urge as a theater director. I'm part of the revolution as a someone who went to streets, but for me it was question what we should do. And I noticed many performances in the time of the revolution. One, one of them, uh, one of the directors of this performances that inspired me to do this festival, she's here, Laila Sulaiman. She, she did a performance very recent after the revolution called No Time for Art. Uh, and it was very important to question what is our role uh, as an artist now when there's a chaos everywhere, there is, uh, there is Many uh, polarization, uh, there is many ideas in the streets, there is uh, people very daring to do some violence stuff, daring to do, uh, to, daring, dare to face uh, police, and you are part of this, but also what is your role as a theater maker? And I remember just last thing, if I have time, I, I don't know. The conclusion now is perfect. 
Yeah. Uh, I remember something. Yeah. <laughs> to phrase it differently. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember uh, I was in Berlin in uh, 2014 or 15. Ah, I was in Berlin in 2015. Uh, and th there's a place called Center for Public Beauty. And they made a call for uh, demonstration. And the, 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 they didn't define themselves as a political group. They defined, they defined themselves as center for uh, risk, uh, risking and saving human lives and using, uh, using art uh, or uh, interfere with art. And, uh, They made this call on the internet, we, we will bury a body of uh, someone thrown in the Mediterranean uh, while he was immigrating. And this, she is a woman, and we will bury her body in the right stack. Uh, and they made the call, and suddenly they, they were shocked. There were thousands of people in the streets, and they went to the right stack and they open the, the they remove the fence and they start digging and and for me thousands of, uh, of people in streets in Berlin it's not uh, very impressive because I was in, in Cairo to, uh, in January uh, in the revolution on the first day I was there and then in Alexandria also my city we were revolting but for me it was the question the important question was it's, did they learn from us anything? Uh, or can we learn from them also to reconnect and to, to do something related to our society, to, to, to order, uh, to, not order, I hate order. Uh, to, like, I don't know what is the word uh, about collective conscious. Consciousness may be something important, but collective co consciousness uh, with practice. Maybe we can uh, uh, create a new terminology, Doctor and Professor. Collective consciousness. It's there. Practice. It's what, there. What, what is, uh, it's there. What, what is uh, Collective consciousness very much exists in the, uh, the description cool. of the uh, Vasubandhu's uh, Abhidharma Kosha Sangrama. It's ancient text. Very much exist. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I hope uh, I, I, uh, it was okay. I had anything uh, to you. Uh, it's not. I, I'm not expert in art and politics. I'm practitioner. I'm art, politics and power. Uh, I don't. So that's what I can say. May, uh, I left this for you. Maybe you read it. Uh, sorry, I, I, bring, I brought some flyers, but my bag uh, didn't come from Paris, so I can't uh, distribute it. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Which is uh, is something which is very independent 
uh, very autonomous, but at the same time, it depends on the practitioner what what he chooses to be or what he chooses to represent. And public memory is um, see there there are there are different ways of public memory. Either you you remember an incident and you keep re-inscribing that narrative time and again, every time. Say for example, I, I again go back to Gandhi, I'm sorry. Uh, evoking Gandhi as a non-violent, as a great champion of anti-colonial uh, struggle, uh, or a great champion of, 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 of human beings and all those things. So this is a public memory. It's a perception which has been created time and again. And neither the Western world or the American world really try to correct their perception or their collective consciousness, you see. So this becomes a problem of the memory. And how do you control those public memories? The, the controlling of the public memory depends on your objectives. And that has deeply embedded in your political positioning and the adherence to certain political principles. Whether your public memory you wish to create or you practice or you wish to inscribe, whether its objective is to make public consciousness, sorry, make public conscious of their self and of their problems and as well as whether that persona or for that matter the art practices can really you know shape your consciousness to change oneself i don't i don't i don't say that art changes society no art doesn't change society no art has changed society so so let us let us to be very practical and at the same time but it really matters a lot like what kind of pol the, uh, the the art practices you make in order to address those issues, in order to address the sufferings of the people, in order to address the very ethos of your consciousness, of public memory. And public memory sometimes are short-lived, sometimes are very deeply, you know, long-lived. Say for example, like everywhere in the world, Hitler is a long-lived memory, at least from today's point of view. And uh, the moment people discover about uh, uh, black book of uh, Heide, uh, Heidegger, that at least there are people and there are there, there are those societies who wish to discard despite being Heidegger a big thing. So whether you have that kind of an enabling process to rectify your public memory. <laughs> Former colonies that um, every that the 
issue of language is, is one that is so explicitly connected to um, the production and, and um, dissemination of knowledge and of authority. I can't, I've tried to think, I don't think there is one country in Africa where the laws are written, where laws are written and um, where law is beaten out in indigenous languages. I think it's usually the constitutions are written in English or French or something. And I think, um, pardon? Not okay, there you go. Someone who knows better than me. I only really know about the Canada. I don't know if I'm kidding. Um, so I think it's, I, I think working from there, I think you can see that there is something that how, what kind, how, how profound the cultural schisms can become. Because obviously everyday life is not conducted necessarily um, in former colonial languages, certainly outside of the spaces of the elite. Um, that said, um, you know, following the Writers' Conference of 1963, have these also become, in some sense, African languages? I think, I don't, I don't wish things away or out of existence. I'm glad that Ching Wai Chiri wrote. I'm glad that I can read what he wrote. I don't want to wish that book never existed. But at the same time, um, what, what is being displaced, what is being um, eclipsed um, through that, and who gets to participate. Um, there was a very interesting, I'm looking at you, Danae, because you helped me to remember. Um, when we were at, um, in Namlanda, at the first meeting of the Africa Cluster, and um, where very quickly we had started to spend a lot of time talking about the issue of language and what it meant that we were having this meeting mostly in English. Now I think our meetings are about to become bilingual because I think the group is growing in a more Francophone direction. Um, but, and I, I remember we were making, we, we got to the public program um, because we have a, the structure of our meetings is in two parts. We have one closed meeting, which is when we sit around and, and um, over a number of days um, pick our way very slowly through the research we've done since the last meeting. We pick up the conversations that began, we report on the work that's been done, and we plan for the future. But at every single meeting, we also have a public program because we also want to share what we are doing with um, the communities um, among which we live and work. And um, the first meeting happened at the Nagenda International Academy of Art and Design, where I was at the time working on, um, on a project called Decolonizing Art Education, which was a staff curriculum development project, which also had a lot of issues with language. And um, I said, I made a proposal on the day of the public program, um, which comprised a number of different presentations, um, discussions, food and music, and, um, and I said, I would really like it if the only people who speak English at this meeting are people who don't speak Luganda. So I would like the project to be presented in <coughs> indigenous languages, and we'll figure it out after that, but I think it's an important thing to do. And, um, and the staff of the school were completely terrified at this prospect, and they said, but there's some white people coming, what will they do? <laughs> And I said, well, you know, how do we manage? You know, and um, maybe it's okay that they don't understand, and maybe we can try to see if it's possible to start to have this conversation in the local language. Um, and the staff made a very brilliant presentation of the project um, and very assiduously arranged simultaneous translation for the three white people who came to the presentation. And um, at the end, one of lots of local artists, um, lots of sort of bigwigs from the local artists had come to this presentation. And one of them asked, <clears throat> why did you do that? Like, what was the point of that exercise? And I said, and I said um, in English, because my Luganda is really rubbish, um, I said, because it felt important to me that the janitor who has opened the door for us every day and cleaned our classrooms and people who sorted out our food um, have access to what we have been doing in this room. And the only way they will have any access 
is if we don't have these conversations exclusively in languages that are only taught well in schools to which the elite only have access. Um, this actually caused a lot of controversy and um, quite interestingly for me personally has um, helped me to extend some of my own individual research inquiry into the relationship between art education and class formation under colonialism in, East, in, in Anglophone East Africa. I think it was a very useful lesson because it was not a popular choice within the mainstream of the visual arts scene at that time. Yeah, just one add on our, one comment, small comment about public memory. It's public memory now. It's uh, related to technology somehow, like to Facebook. Like uh, people now uh, documenting their life, and then it's gone. Like it's you are posting a photo, and you you are this action is you are documenting this moment, and then it's gone from the timeline. So it's also the question of public memory. Maybe it's, uh, it's uh, deep rooted in, in Europe. Maybe uh, in some groups in, uh, in Egypt, I can't talk. Uh, yes, they are interested because they suffered and they pay. But uh, also, it's uh, now the, global, the digital native people, for them, public uh, memory is something uh, more just a, a small announcement, sorry to interrupt, um, because it's supposed to be you know, at 5 o'clock there's the next conversation at Kazem, but we definitely do want to leave uh, some opportunity for the audience to ask some questions, and hence we want just to communicate as well with the three of you if you feel the need to have some breathing in before going to the next conversation at Kazem, which is about 15 minutes old. I think um, in a couple of ways. Um, in the project that I recently did in South Africa, I think um, I used dance as the way to engage with those communities. And so um, whether it's through dances that are from that particular place um, or just an understanding of movement um, and how that affects different groups of people, um, that can be integrated into different projects and different programs. I would also say that being a dancer also, like most of us in the room, you are able to kind of think um, creatively about new solutions. So I think one of the challenges within diplomatic um, and, uh, institutions and also development institutions is that the range of tools that are used to address our biggest global challenges is, is limited, right, to what the, their experiences are. And I think I see part of my role in this work is to expand that and to say, you know, there's, there's many different types of people that you can be engaging in to address these issues. And it doesn't have to always be a policy brief and 
um, you know, yet another round table with the same people that are always at the table, right? That we need to expand who, who can participate in all of that. Um, and the, I think artistic background provides some flexibility in thinking about those different uh, solutions. And did you experience any problems? <coughs> Yeah, I think it's a question of um, identity and what you present to different people. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's like putting on your costume and changing costumes depending on the various audiences that you're speaking with. Um, and I think it's only been recently that I have been showing both at the same time and saying that, yes, I might be involved in the policy space and trying to influence um, decisions uh, on that level, but, but increasingly showing that um, this other side. Um, and I think one of the challenges is that there's skepticism, um, as many of you know, among donor communities and, uh, and larger institutions that, um, you know, it, it sounds soft. Um, and that's, I think, the wrong, um, that's a misconception. And I think that that's a, a, a stereotype that I'm trying to work on to show that, no, it's not soft. This is actually at the core of what it means to address human conflict and, and these bigger issues. Questions? Yes. Uh, it's part of your study, it's rather a statement, uh, a short story as well, where we are talking about arts, uh, politics, and power. First of all, thank you for the respectable panel for such elaborating this, this very important topic. And especially, I would mention the professor staff in my team because his presentation created a lot of questions that uh, I had in my head. Talking about this arts, politics, and power, I would like to use a very like you know funny sort of a quote, you know that would explain this uh, in a better way. You know over the internet I was just reading and it said that you know until the lion learns how to write, the history will always glorify the hunter. You know so so of course you know one power holder you know unless everything is with them. So the other party until you know they are equipped with something, they will always be like you know not mentioned clearly in their history books. So that's somehow like you know how I see it. Because I have a little background of working for the political departments for like different foreign missions in, in my previous jobs. So that I could relate that you know it's always this struggle like you know power opinion which is coming outside. But the important thing is that it's it should keep on reflecting what's happening actually. And one thing that in the panel discussion it was somehow mentioned that probably you know art doesn't impact. So I slightly disagree with that and basically say that you know even the small steps, you know, we've seen in the history that small, small steps, you know, to be that, you know, any philosopher or a poet or anybody. So that has made an impact overall. Yeah. I will take this point just because also take, take all together. All together. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> if they have any questions. Uh, yeah, very brief response. Uh, the it's not about whole idea of place for articulation. You know, we always try for the place for articulation. It's not that the place for articulation is uh, becomes the uh, good objective. Rather, I would say good objective. Uh, rather, it is the power of articulation that matters the most. What who has that power of articulation? And the struggle for power of articulation will always go on as long as there are inequalities, as well as as long as there are anarchies, as long as there are those inhuman kind of a practices. Thank you. Thank you. Some more? Yeah. No? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Thanks uh, to everyone for uh, your participation. There are more questions for sure. There is some coffee outside and maybe also uh, further uh, because I'm making the conversation. Thank you.